welcome to the new chapter of uh, gauges for pressure measurement under the edges of chemical process utilities. So, in this particular uh, lecture, we are going to discuss uh, about the direct measuring vacuum gauges after the brief introduction about uh, the topic uh, which we are going to discuss. Then we will discuss about the indirect measuring vacuum gauges. Now, the Torricelli tubes, uh, this was the sole device capable of measuring the vacuum for almost 350 years uh, uh, from 1644 until around say 1900. Now, it was based on the counterbalancing of mercury columns, uh, gravitational pull against a pressure differential between the uh, two volumes separated by the liquid mercury. So, it was uh, an absolute instrument if one of uh, the volumes was under vacuum condition and that is the mercury vapor pressure and the pressure was measured in mm of uh, Hg and subsequently in tor. Now, despite the fact that uh, the Torricelli tube is no longer in use, uh, the meter convention CGPM was uh, enacted in uh, roughly 1960 when the system international or sometimes referred as SI of physical units replaced the tor with the Pascal. Now, these units are still in use in some places as pressure is defined by the Pascal um, is a force of 1 Newton per square meter and that is referred as P is equal to F upon A. So, one can still use the bar for 10 to the power 5 Pascal, hence 1 uh, millibar is equal to 100 Pascal. Now, the pressure can be measured either by a direct measurement of the force per area that is the direct gauge or uh, indirectly by measuring any quantity which is comparative to the pressure that is a molecular density or uh, the impingement rate of uh, the molecules, the thermal conductivity etcetera. There are so many ways. Now, the direct pressure measurement is limited to the pressures greater than around 1 millipascal. The force on 1 uh, square centimeter at this pressure is just 10 to the power minus 7 Newton requiring an electrically amplified signal. Now, here you see the direct measuring vacuum gauges, uh, this uh, mechanical or direct vacuum gauges again the mathematical representation that is pressure as force per area again it can be subdivided into two different aspects when we talk about the classification of directly measuring vacuum gauges. One is the solid area and second one is the liquid area. So, if we take a liquid area first into consideration it can be subdivided into two different categories one is the U tube manometer and second second one is the macloid and if we take the solid area into consideration it can be in the membrane vacuum uh, gauge then the piston gauge and the elastic element gauge type or burden gauges. Uh, whereas, membrane gauges, uh, membrane vacuum gauge is uh, uh, referred as the capacitance diaphragm gauge or resonance silicon gauge. Now, if we talk about the indirect measuring vacuum gauges uh, and if we talk about the classification of these indirectly measuring vacuum gauge according to their principle of measurement, uh, this can be divided into three different categories. One is ionization um, rate, then heat conductivity and the momentum transfer. Now, this heat conductivity is again subdivided into the Pirani gauge and thermocouple whereas, the momentum transfer is referred to the spinning rotor gauge. Now, if, talk, if we talk, talk about the ionization rate then one is the emitting cathodes, another one is the classification is based on the crossed electromagnetic field. Now, if we take the crossed magnetic uh, uh, electric field it can again subdivide it into three different aspects. One is Leffert leaf, then panning and uh, the magnetron inverted uh, uh, magnetron. Now, uh, this emitting cathode is subdivided into triode, Baird Alpert, extractor and extractor is again uh, 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 referred to the, the extractor with energy analysis. Now, the benefit of direct measuring vacuum gauges is that their reading are independent of the gas species. They are accurately determine the overall pressure of a gas combination or a single gas. The signal of indirect measuring vacuum gauges is dependent on the type of the gas for a given pressure and as a result it may be difficult to transform the signal into an accurate pressure reading if uh, the composition of the gaseous mixture is unknown. 
Now, uh, there are a concept of error and uncertainty in the, the measurement. Now, an error of uh, the reading of a measuring device, this can be calculated as the true value minus measured value as defined by the SI system. Now, even after all errors have been eliminated and all known adjustments have been applied, each calculated value of the physical quantities is still an estimate. The range within which a measured value may not represent the real value indicated by the SI unit is known as the uncertainty of a measured value. A low uncertainty measurement will result from a high quality measurement and uh, vice versa. Let us talk about the direct measuring vacuum gauges. Uh, now, one is uh, the mercury manometer, which is very common in nature. So, when used correctly, the mercury manometer remains the most accurate pressure gauge. Now, it has the it has practically vanished from the commercial market due to the danger of mercury because you know that mercury is highly carcinogenic and highly um, you can say uh, 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 dangerous uh, uh, metal. Uh, now, but it is still utilized by the National Metallurgical Institutes where utmost precision is necessary. So, the pressure difference here you see the height difference is this is uh, the usual mercury manometer and this is uh, the mercury being filled. So, this is the height difference based on the pressure and uh, you, uh, you uh, the, the gas the uh, gas is uh, uh, lit over here. Now, the, pr the pressure difference between the two volumes 1 and 2 is given by delta P is equal to P 1 minus P 2 and uh, it is equal to rho G into delta H. Rho is the density uh, um, of mercury and that is uh, 13.5 gram per uh, ml and G is the local acceleration due to gravity. Now, volume 2 this one the volume 2 is usually pumped down to the 5 in volume and P2 is the approximately given by the vapor pressure of the mercury. Now, delta H this one, the delta H can also be very low uncertainty by optical interfer uh, interferometrical method or the phase sensitive ultrasound detection. Now, the P1 can be measured with the highest accuracy with the relative uncertainty is as low as uh, 2 into 10 to the power minus 6. Now, mercury manometers, they are primary standards for vacuum pressure from about uh, say 100 Pascal to 10 to the power 5 uh, Pascal and therefore, the, the traceability of pressure to the SI unit of mass, time and length. McLeod gauge. McLeod gauge uh, uh, improved the domain of the mercury U tube manometer for several orders of magnitude by compressing the gas to be measured by moving the mercury in capillaries. It was invented in 1873 by H. G. McLeod and served as primary standard for pressure from 10 to the power minus 4 Pascal up to the range of mercury manometer until uh, the 1960s. A gas of known volume is compressed to a small volume, the final value of which indicates the applied pressure. The gas used must obey the Boyle's law, which is given by P1 V1 is equal to P2 V2, where P1 is the pressure of uh, gas at initial condition, P2 is the pressure of the gas at the final condition, V1 is the volume of the gas at initial condition and V2 is the volume of the gas at final condition. Now, initial condition means before compression and final condition means after compression. Now, the principle of McLeod gauge is that a low pressure gas is compressed to high pressure uh, and a smaller volume. The resultant volume and the pressure changes provide the amount of initial pressures. Now, it consists of a reference column attached with a reference capillary tube and the reference capillary tube has a point called zero reference point. Now, here you see that this is the reference one. Now, this reference column is connected to a bulb and measuring capillary and the place of connection of the bulb with the reference column is called as cutoff point. Now, it is termed uh, the cutoff point because if the mercury level rises over the point, the applied pressure to the bulb and measuring capillary is cut off. A mercury reservoir is located underneath the reference column and the bulb and is it is controlled by a piston. Now, here you see this is the piston. 
Now let us talk about the operation of this McLeod gauge. Now this uh, is uh, very well illustrated in this particular figure. The pressure to be measured P1 um, is applied at the top of McLeod gauge. Now here you see um, uh, now the gauge uh, gauge mercury level is raised by the working the pressure to fill the volume as per the uh, you can see in this uh, particular figure. Now, when this is the case, you can refer as a case number 1, the applied pressure fills the bulb and the capillary. Now, again the piston is operated so that the mercury level in the gauge increases. When the mercury level reaches the cutoff point, a known volume of gas that is uh, sometimes referred as V1 is trapped in the bulb and measuring the capillary tube. The mercury level is further raised by operating the piston. So, the, the trapped gas in the bulb and mercury capillary tubes are compressed. Now, this is done until the mercury level reaches to the zero reference point. Now, here this is the zero reference point. Now, in this condition, the volume of the gas in the measuring capillary tube is read directly by the scale beside it and that is the difference in the height delta H. Now, the, the, uh, this is the, delta, uh, the H of the measuring capillary and the reference capillary becomes a measure of the volume and the pressure of the final condition of the trapped gas. Now, as V1, V2 and P2 are known, the applied pressure P2 can be calculated using the Boyle's law by P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2. Now, let the volume of the bulb from the cutoff point up to the beginning of the measuring capillary tube be V. Let the area of cross section of the measuring capillary tube is A and small a and the let height of the measuring of the capillary tube is HC. Therefore, the initial volume of the gas entrapped in the bulb plus measuring capillary tube is given by V1 is equal to V plus AHC. Now, when the mercury has been forced upward to reach the zero reference point, the reference capillary, the final volume of the gas would be V2 plus A H, where H is the height of the compressed gas in the measuring capillary tube. P1 is the applied pressure of the gas, P2 is the pressure of the gas in the final condition and that is after the compression and that is equal to P1 plus H. So, we have a Boyle's law with us that is P1 V1 is equal to P2 V2, therefore P1 V1 is equal to P1 because we have indicated that this one is equal to P1 plus H. Uh, into A H. So, P 1 V 1 is equal to um, P 1 A H plus A H square or P 1 V 1 minus uh, P 1 A H is equal to A H square or P 1 is equal to A H square over V 1 minus A H. Since uh, this A H is very small when compared to uh, V 1, it can be neglected. So, therefore, P 1 is equal to A H square over V 1. Therefore, the applied pressure is calculated using the McLeod gauge. Now, there are various advantages uh, associated with the McLeod gauge. Now, it is unaffected by makeup of the gas. It is used to calibrate uh, other low pressure gauge as a reference standard. The applied pressure and uh, H have a linear relationship and the McLeod gauge reading do not require any kind of uh, modifications. But uh, when we talk about the advantages, then there must be certain disadvantages or a limitation. Of, so, let us talk about the limitation of McLeod gauge. Now, Boyle's law must be followed by the gas whose pressure is to be measured, first thing. Second thing is the moisture traps must be installed to prevent the excessive vapor from entering uh, the gauge. And third one is that it merely takes a sample of data and fourth it is unable to produce a continuous output. So, these are the limitations of McLeod gauge. Let us talk about the piston gauge. Now, in a, in a very tight fitting or in a tightly fitted uh, circular cylinder, a cylinder piston revolves. So, the, press, the pressure at the piston uh, base is equal to the total downward force on the piston over effective area of the piston cylinder assembly while floating at this at its uh, operational level. Now, because the piston um, uh, will float only when the pressure underneath exactly balance the force from the top. Uh, which can be changed by weight placed on the piston, the revolving piston gauge is a pressure generator. 
for absolute pressure measurement the pressure in the evacuated bell jar must be treated as volume 2 in the uh, mercury manometer. Now, at a cross section of say 10 square centimeter the gap between the piston and cylinder is generally a few tenth of a, a micron. To avoid the friction effects the piston must be rotated. From 10 to the power 3 Pascal to atmospheric pressure piston gauges can serve as a principal standard for vacuum with somewhat more error uh, than mercury manometers. There are other non-rotating uh, uh, piston cylinder assemblies. Uh, in such situation the force F is measured uh, with the balance and the effective area A is obtained by calibrating with the mercury manometer. Now, these gauges have a resolution of 1 millipascal and an excellent accuracy from 10 Pascal to about say 10 kilo Pascal which is uh, their highest pressure limit. Let us talk about the mechanical gauge, you can see the, the typical diagram of this mechanical gauge. Now, most mechanical gauges they use membrane to detect the force of the pressure. Now, on this membrane the force F is equal to P1 minus P2 into A is exerted which will cause a deflection X of the membrane that can be used for measurement. Now, in most cases uh, um, the, now this X is uh, converted to an angle psi that can be used for a needle indicator. Now, when the reference pressure P2 is negligible uh, compared to P1, the instrument shows uh, the absolute pressure. Now, there are various types of uh, mechanical gauges, uh, there are four type uh, which are in popular, one is the diaphragm pressure gauge then burden tube pressure gauge, then bellow pressure gauge and then dead weight pressure gauge. So, let us talk about the diaphragm pressure gauge. Now, it is uh, to uh, used to measure the pressures above or below the atmospheric pressure. It is usually employed to measure relatively low pressures. A diaphragm pressure gauge in its uh, simplest form consists of a corrugated diaphragm. Now, that the gauge is connected uh, to the fluid which is under pressure causes some deformation to the diaphragm. Now, with the help of uh, a pinion system elastic deformation of the diaphragm rotates the pointer and the pointer moves over a calibrated scale which is uh, which directly gives the pressure. There are various advantages attributed to the diaphragm pressure gauge. One is beneficial for low pressure, it is reasonably priced, it has a broad spectrum used to calculate the gauge atmospheric and differential pressures, it is quite dependable. But simultaneously there are so many disadvantages like impact resistance is not good, difficulty in maintenance and it has the lower measurement pressure. Let us talk about the burden tube pressure gauge. This is a mechanical pressure measuring apparatus and that use a curved or twisted metal tube flattened in uh, cross section and closed as it is a sensing element. Uh, this is known as the burden tube. It is used to gauge the pressure of a gases or liquid. It is made up of a semicircular or a spiral uh, flexible metal tube connected to a gauge that measures how much the tube straight, uh, straightened owing the uh, pressure of the gas or liquid contained. It is most commonly used to monitor high pressures. The instrument is attached to the pressurized fluid that flows into the burden tube. The tube tends to straighten, straighten uh, as a result of the increased pressure. Because the tube is covered in a round cover, it tends to become circular rather than straight. The elastic deformation of the burden tube turns the pointer through a simple pinion and a sector arrangement. The pointer glides over the calibrated scale like this um, and displays the pressure immediately. The advantage attributed to the burden tube pressure gauge is that the manufacturing process is straightforward and cost is modest. It has a very high sensitivity, it is uh, quite accurate 
this gauge is offered a variety of ranges, but simultaneously there are several disadvantages like uh, slow reaction to uh, pressure changes, uh, it is susceptible to shock and vibration, it experiences hysteresis, the low pressure situation is not accessible. Now, this type of pressure gauge is used in the gas distribution system during the hydraulic and pneumatic installation. Let us talk about the bellow pressure gauge. The bellow pressure gauge principal component is a bellow, um, it is having the tortoise elastic thin walled metallic cylinder and a travel axially as uh, pressure changes. Most bellows are spring loaded which helps to prevent the bellow from uh, fully expanding and the expansion limit protects the bellows and extends its service life. The bellows are connected to the pressure inlet and the linkage which is attached to the pointer B. When the pressure to be measured in a, is applied to the one side of the bellow, inner or outer layer, the pressure results in the movement of the bellow. The bellows linear movement is subsequently conveyed to the linkage. The displacement is then represented by the pointer in contact with the linkage to display the system's exact pressure reading. There are various applications associated with the this uh, bellow uh, pressure gauge, one is uh, HVAC that is heating, ventilation and air conditioning system, system of power transmission, then aeronautical systems, then electrical uh, interrupters, then industrial control systems. There are various advantages uh, associated with the uh, bellow pressure gauges, one is that it is reasonably priced, then it has the ability to unleash uh, the uh, a lot of forces. Uh, can handle both uh, absolute and differential pressures. It is acceptable in low to moderate range, but simultaneously there are a couple of disadvantages attributed to this bellow pressure gauges. It must be adjusted for the ambient temperature that is one of the, uh, the, the disadvantage. It is ineffective at high pressures and the supply of fabrication metal is restricted. So, these are the, the various disadvantages associated with the bellow pressure gauge. Now, let us talk about the dead weight tester. A dead weight tester is a device that calibrates pressure by, by calculating the weight of a force divided by the area over which the force is delivered. The dead weight testing, the, for, uh, the formula is the pressure equals force divided by the area where the force is applied. Because dead weights have a great precision, they can be utilized as primary standards for pressure gauge calibration. Now, there are uh, several variants uh, depending on the use and they are powered by oil that is hydraulic or air that is called pneumatic. The fundamental primary standard for reliable pressure measurement is dead weight tester. Now, dead weight testers are used to measure the pressure exerted by gas or liquid as well as to provide a test procedure for uh, calibration of a variety of pressure sensors. Now, let us talk about uh, the indirect measuring vacuum gauges. Uh, one is the thermocouple gauges. Uh, the thermocouple gauges uh, as the name you can implies use the thermocouple attached to the hot wire to measure its uh, temperature. For example, a thermocouple gauge is used to monitor a pump down cycle and the wire will become hotter and hotter as the pressure drops and fewer molecules are available to transfer heat away from the wire. Now, heat is also transferred by flow through both uh, the thermocouple wire and the support feed through uh, pins for the hot wire. Now, this means um, that the entire sensing array must be constructed of uh, conducting metal leads that are uh, of as small as diameter as possible to avoid excess heat loss. Now, this problem becomes more acute at the gauge's lowest pressure when the wire is at its hottest level. Since uh, the heated wire in most thermocouple gauges needs to operate at maximum temperature between 200 to 300 degree Celsius. It is made from noble metal such as platinum to avoid oxidation problem. At the lowest pressure, the hot, water, hot wire is often expo exposed to oil vapors if oil sealed mechanical 
pumps are used. The oil vapors can either crack to leave carbon deposit or polymerize to leave a layer of thermal insulation on the wire. Since uh, the back streaming rate of pumps oil is greatest at low pressure, this can be significant problem since it will change to the gauge calibration. Although it is uh, sometimes possible to clean the gauges by rinsing with solvent, success is uh, by no means assured. The solvent might not totally remove coating and the electrode uh, array need to be delicate enough uh, so that sloshing liquid can easily cause the mechanical damage. The necessary uh, delicacy also uh, means that uh, they will not withstand uh, mishandling shocks such as uh, a free drop into a concrete floor. Thermocouple gauges are calibrated such that the wire's temperature is displayed as uh, a pressure reading. Now, this allows such problem as uh, a variation in heat flow through the supporting electrodes to be taken into account. One problem that uh, can't be, can be um, calibrated uh, for it is based on the fact that the wire must change temperature with pressure changes. Even though uh, the heat capacity and the thermal flow characteristics of the sensing array is kept for a, to a minimum, there is uh, some lag time associated with the temperature changes in response uh, to pressure change. In most application, this is not a problem, but rapid pressure changes such as uh, might be found in rapid pump down or backfilling operations can show significant delays in response time. Let us talk about the Pirani gauge. Now, Pirani gauge also takes advantage uh, uh, to the change in temperature of a heated wire, but unlike thermocouple gauges, they do not measure the wire temperature directly. Instead, they make use of the fact that the resistance of a metal wire changes with the wire temperature. Now, if a heated wire is made to be one, or one leg of uh, the Wheatstone bridge uh, with a balancing leg exposed to the ambient temperature as a, as a compensator and both of these are set against two fixed resistor, a balanced circuit will go out of the balance as the sensor wire changes resistance with the pressure change and that change the wire's temperature. Pirani gauge in general operates uh, with a heated wire and that is uh, much cooler say around 120 to 200 degrees Celsius than a thermocouple gauge and this makes them less likely to become contaminated by mechanical pump oil. Now, Pirani gauge uh, that are heated with the constant uh, current uh, will usually have a faster response time than thermocouple gauges due to such difference as uh, smaller electrodes. Many modern gauges now operate in constant temperature mode. A separate circuit constantly changes power input to maintain a constant sensor resistance. Now, this produces full scale response time in millisecond. Let us talk about the spinning rotor gauge. Now, similar to thermal conductivity gauge, the spinning rotor gauge has the best performance when the molecule can freely travel within the gauge and when the signal at the same time is significantly higher than the pressure independent null sign or signal. Now, as far as the thermal conductivity, the viscosity is present at all pressures, but only for pressure where the molecule freely travel within the gauge is linearly proportional to pressure. Now, similar to the thermal conductivity gauge, the spinning rotor gauge has the best performance when the molecules can freely travel within the gauge and when the signal at the same time is significantly higher than a pressure independent null signal. As far as uh, or as for the thermal conductivity, the viscosity is uh, present at all pressures, but only for pressures where the molecule freely travel within the gauge is linearly proportional to the pressure. The magnetical, uh, magnetically suspended ball like this, uh, this of a steel rotates in a vacuum thimble. The molecules that hit the rotor from the wall will stick to it for a moment. Now, if the ball did not rotate, the molecules would dis, uh, dissolve again from it uh, with a, a cosine distribution. 
Now, since the ball rotates, however, the molecule leaving the surface will have an additional velocity vector according to the tangential velocity of the rotor. The molecule will have a the full tangential velocity of the rotor when they are completely accommodated to the surface. Now, it turned out that this actually happens for technical surfaces and accommodation factor of tangential movement term is very close to 1. Now, this additional tangential momentum of the molecule is gained from the rotational energy of the rotor. Now, this means that the rotor de decelerates with each molecule hitting and leaving the rotor. The measurement range um, of the spinning rotor gauge is from 10 to the power minus 4 Pascal to about 1 Pascal. Lower pressure are possible with the vibration isolation. At higher pressure, the rotor needs frequent re-acceleration, warms up heat and surrounding gas and accuracy is lost. At pressure of about say 100 Pascal, the signal become independent of the pressure since the gas becomes continuum. The spinning rotor gauge is a commonly in, uh, inert vacuum gauge. It does not consume any gas that is by ionization. It does not dissociate the molecules like hot cathode. It outgassing rate is the same uh, as the thimble wall material. It is an ideal instrument to measure uh, the outgassing rate by the pressure rise method. Now, in addition, the spinning rotor gauge gives a very accurate signal and uh, you can say the uncertainty is as low as 0.3 percent and the long term stability is excellent. Now, for this reason, it is an ideal secondary reference standard in high vacuum and can be used to calibrate ion gauges. Now, ionization gauges, a thermal conductivity gauge can follow the pressure all the way through the volume zone. But when the system goes into the dry down zone below about 10 to the power minus 3 torr, where water vapor becomes the predominant residual gas and ionization gauge is required. In general, with the exception of some extended range gauge modification, these two gauges together can be used to cover the full pump down cycle. Now, the pressure P in an enclosed gaseous system is defined as the force Df uh, per area dA exerted by the gas in the chamber. Now, in a fundamental manner, forces can be measured for practical areas of a few square centimeter down to about 1 Pascal. For example, with an elaborated YouTube manometer filled with mercury or oil. In capacitance diaphragm gauges or membrane gauges, the force is used to bend the membrane due to the differential pressure, but the force cannot be determined in a fundamental way and the gauge has to be calibrated. Now, in the high and ultra high vacuum re regime, however, it is uh, no more possible to use the force on a certain area as indicator for the pressure and other physical proportion of the gas like gas friction, viscosity, thermal conductivity or particle density, they are used to indicate the pressure. Now, in ionization gauges, uh, the, the particle density n um, in the gauge volume is measured. Therefore, it is important to remember the ideal gas law for enclosed system uh, in equilibrium that is P is equal to n k t. It is not sufficient to measure n with an ion gauge, but also the temperature T of the gas has to be known to indicate pressure with the an uh, Ig. Now, n is measured in a way uh, that the neutral gas molecules are ionized and then counted usually by measuring a current. The ionization normally takes place by electron, but also photon that is a high intensity laser or ions can be used. Now, there are two types of uh, ionization gauges. One is the cold cathode gauges or crossed field ion gauges and second one is the hot cathode ionization gauges or emitting cathode ionization gauges. So, in this particular uh, lecture, we discussed about the various uh, measuring devices and instrumentation method to, for measuring the, the pressure and uh, other things which are useful in uh, the chemical process utilities. For your convenience, we have enlisted uh, one reference you can go through if you need to have a further uh, information. Thank you very much.